Good evening. Welcome to the Vortex Sarasota Show. I'm your host, George Lewis. Well, I'll tell you what, I've been talking with my guests here before the show. We've been having a really good time. I think you'll have a great time. We're going to talk tonight about science of mind in Ernest Holmes. And our guest, Jerry Gregg, uh, is a, a historian with Science of Mind. And so we're going to find out a, a good deal about Science of Mind tonight. Welcome, Jerry. Uh, good well, to have you, you on the show, my friend. I thank appreciate you, you coming in here, spend a little time with me tonight. So you've been you've been here in Sarasota. You were telling me for how long? 37, 38 years. Thirty-eight years, and mm -hmm. you've been in metaphysical metaphysics from uh, that time. Um, actually, I was born in a metaphysical church. Were you? I was born into a Swedenborgian church in Cincinnati, Ohio. Um, my folks were married in a metaphysical church in 1929. So uh, unlike most people who are in metaphysical churches, I come by it naturally. Let me tell you something about the Swedenborg uh, church that you may not know. They actually have a big connection with Alcoholics Anonymous. Really? Yeah. I was not aware of that. Yeah. The uh, uh, Lois, who was Bill Wilson's wife, was her father was a Swedenborgian minister. Okay. And so, and there's a good deal of uh, that uh, that thinking involved in the whole setup. With uh, well, I've never been any in, in any of the twelve step programs, but I'm quite familiar. And so much of the programs in the Big Book is very, very similar. Absolutely. To New Thought. Absolutely. So. That's really interesting to know. Very interesting, isn't it? Well, you know, uh, the founder, Bill Wilson, was a mystic. He I was, didn't know I, that. You, you know, the name Jerry Hurd? You remember Gerald Hurd? Was, he was a mystic, uh, and uh, I can't think of the author. I'll think of it. Uh, they were on the West Coast. Okay. And, uh, he, he had uh, become friends with them and did a little LSD to get a little spiritual uh, enlightenment. Mm -hmm. and, uh, but uh, yeah, so let's talk about science of mind. That's what we came here All to right. talk about. Uh, how long have you been involved with science of mind? I got, actually, I, I started with Unity. Right. And I started with Unity in 1978 here in Sarasota. And the reason I did was my then wife and I knew that a baby was coming. So we wanted a church. And I went to a number of churches, and on a Thursday afternoon, I walked into Unity, and I walked into the, just the hallway, and I just had this overwhelming feeling, I'm home. You were there. I was there. Uh, so I was there for several years, many, many years. And um, I wanted to get more involved in learning and so forth and wound up getting connected with Science of Mind. Gotcha. So I took a little time off from Unity and became involved with Science of Mind, and then I've been involved with both of them ever since. I got, I, you know, and I, I want to really kind of quiz you a little bit on when you left, why you left, and what was going on, but I got involved with uh, Unity back in 75 in Fort Myers. I started okay. going to Unity. The, the Unity minister there, you know, unity is kind of an unusual uh, in that it, it can be highly Christian-based or it can be low-key Christian, depending on the church you go to. When you left unity to go to the science of mind, did that have any kind of influence on you? Uh, no, but it does today. Yeah. It does today. Um, I have a very good friend who is an old-time unity minister. Right. And I commented to him one time, you know, unity is very bipolar. Totally and bipolar. <laughs> he yeah. just broke into wild laughter. And he, right. he, he does a lot of work with Unity Village, and he laughed, and he said, yeah, they know it, we know it. And what you have are the people who are more science of mind that believe in the oneness, right. the one source, and then you have the people who are very God-oriented, right. which in their speaking structure creates separation. And you have the unity ministers that do both at the same time. Well, yeah, and you, you kind of, in that bipolar switch, you kind of go from the oneness you talked about to anthropomorphic. Absolutely. And that's a huge problem. Absolutely. For, you know, yeah. In that. 
Uh, okay, good. So you went to Science of Mind, and uh, uh, tell, give us a little background on, on Ernst Holmes and Science of Mind. Okay. Um, Science of Mind is part of the whole New Thought tradition, and the New Thought tradition, most people say it started with uh, Quimby, right? and uh, I would say it really started back with Swedenborg in Europe in the 1600s, Yes, uh, because the people like Ralph Waldo Emerson and those people who were in New England, they studied in a Swedenborgian uh, school. Right. That's where they got their ministerial degree. Uh, at the same time, Quimby was there, and there are a number of, of um, paths in New Thought. One of them is healing. Yes. And one of them is the intellectual. And Quimby was definitely healing. Head and heart. Head and heart. Uh, and the person who followed Quimby was Mary Baker Eddy with yes. si uh, Christian Science. And she got in a world of trouble. She created a world of trouble. She created she a world of trouble. She was an interesting lady. Very. Very interesting lady. And her relationship with Quimby went everywhere from they may have been intimate to she at one point said they never knew each other. Is that right? Yeah. Just and of course, totally just there are hundreds of people who have written and talked about them knowing each other, so right. that wasn't the truth. Uh, however, when I say that about Mary Baker Eddy, let me back up and say her church with Christian Science has done an amazing amount to move the whole idea of new thought and this awareness forward. Maybe more than any modern May, Maybe church. more than any yeah. other, yeah. because the church has been so solid for so many years, and uh, it's very solid today. Yes. Yeah, and it's gone through the fire. It's gone through the fire. And still stood fast. Yes. Uh, they've had uh, criminal cases against yes. for, uh, you know, some of their parishioners for uh, yeah. not taking their uh, children to doctors and yeah. well, the China, biggest you know. ones they had was here in Sarasota, uh, eighteen or twenty years ago. Is that right? Yeah, you know, I, I recall that. Yeah, yeah, that was pretty pretty powerful. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. um, in that whole tradition, um, back at near uh, the turn of the century, a man named Ernest Holmes, born in 87, 1887 died in 1960, Ernest Holmes decided he wanted to find out what was a commonality in all thought, right. in all religions, in all faiths, in all creeds, in all beliefs. And he spent years and years of study. And he then wrote the book Science of Mind. Right. Where do I hold this? Right like in this? front of your nose. Right in front of my nose. There you go. He wrote this book, and then he wrote 50 other books. Right. Um, if I were going to start, I would not start with Science of Mind. I'd start with one of his later books, uh, because this is 100-year-old English. Right. But um, what he came up with was the concept of there is a oneness, one source. The one source is everything. It is everything. It's every physical thing, every grain of sand, every planet, the whole cosmos. It's every thought, every feeling, every emotion, every being. It is life itself. Which brings us to a real, uh, I, I don't know if problem is the right word, but you know, we, there are those people who say that this source doesn't have polarity. Doesn't have polarity. The oneness. There's no polarity. There's no light and dark. No. Well, if if the source is everything, then I I would contend that he's light. The source is light and dark and oneness. No, the source is everything, and what well, what well, happens every, is but every, we as but human, everything includes the light and dark, right? No. Okay. Uh, we as humans are one with the source. Mm -hmm. Um, we have a true divinity because we are one with the source. We can't be separated. Couldn't agree more. But we do have uh, an independence. We have a free will. And we've created light and dark. Uh -huh. So George so, created so, light and dark. Jerry so created light and dark. How much did I have when I created, what, Mars, Pluto, 
or go out to the edge of the universe? How much did I have to do with that? Um, the human body of George who's sitting here, I don't know how much you had to do with it. Probably darn little. Yeah, there's a lot of understanding that I don't have and will never have. I guess maybe the easiest analogy for me is that the source is like the ocean. Each human is like a wave. Right. Each wave can be named. It could be numbered. There's an infinite number of waves. There seem to be close to an infinite number of people. But the waves cannot be taken out of the ocean. Right. They are a part of the source. They can never be removed from the ocean. And yet they are different from one another. They're different. So how much does one wave have to do with a wave a thousand miles away. Well, we won't stay stuck there, but I, I certainly have my viewpoint on, mm -hmm. you know, as far as whether the source is not light and dark and all of that. Uh, we'll go forward. Very good. Yeah, we'll go forward. So, uh, okay, on that basis, what book would you recommend if they were, if they really were thinking about Science of Mind? Is there a first book? Um, I would just go into um, anything on the web and find Ernest Holmes. And he's got uh, understanding the science of mind, this the science of mind, gotcha. that the science of mind. Any of them are good. And find something you that feels And they're good. shorter, they're more succinct. Any one of those I would recommend. Were you also a follower of Emmett Fox? Uh, I, I love reading Emmett Fox, yes. Wonderful, yeah. Yes. Emmett Fox. They were about the same time, too. They were Emmer about the same time. I think Emmett Fox was up on Riverside in New York, there where his right. church was, yeah. He was a little bit later, but he uh, he was an amazing man. He was really a true new thought person. Absolutely. He, he lived it, he taught it, never developed a church, he just taught it, and he wrote it. Yeah. Wonderful. Yeah, he just was... His, his Someone who is interested in this kind of thinking... Pick up any of the writings of Emmett Fox. They're wonderful. Sermon on the Mount, especially if you're Christian. Yes, will, yes. Will really help yes. tremendously. Yeah. yeah, his interpretation is great. Yeah, yeah. And and it kind of breaks through some of the old uh, thought patterns that we're stuck with. You know, he, he brings in those new... Same thing with Ernest Holmes. You know, he brings in these whole new concepts that like just kind of jab you right in the forehead. And, and yeah, make, Ernest Holmes makes the point... Jesus was definitely divine. Right. But so are you. So are we. So am I. So are all the others in the studio here, and so is every human being. Well, if, if, if you read the Bible clearly in the New Testament, Jesus makes that point very strongly. Imagine that. Yeah, how about that? <laughs> <laughs> Imagine that. Yeah. Over and over again. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and so many quote-unquote religions have taken what, not what Jesus said, but what's been said about Jesus. About and uh, actually, Jesus is what I would call a new thought thinker if you go back and really look at what he said. I, I'm sure that he, you know, those lost years were spent in, in some wisdom schools, often India or, you know, wherever, uh, because it certainly shows in, mm -hmm. in, in, you know, in what he says. Especially in the... Uh, when you get into some of the other writings that weren't were excluded from the Bible, right? You know, then At the Council of Nicaea, they they totally what, messed things. Three forty, what was it? Three hundred something. Yeah, yeah. Um, the, the world changed in Christendom at that point. Yeah. Uh, Constantine found he wasn't beating the Christians, um, so let's take them over. So he convened a the Council of Nicaea, and he brought in all of the writings, all of the books, and they were, now this is 350 years after Jesus. Yep. Many of them very diverse, a few of them silly, some of them very profound. There were those that said he was totally human, no divinity. There were those that said he was totally divine, no humanity. And as they worked through them. What they did was created a system with a church that Constantine could control. Absolutely. 
and it controlled the people. And it controlled the people up to, what, 100 years ago. Well, yeah, the Roman Empire it was falling at that point. And, and right. the Roman Empire really just kind of morphed, didn't it? Into uh, pretty yeah. much, you yeah. know. The, well, you know, there were a lot of books like, uh, and teachers like Valentinius. Are you familiar? I'm, you know, I can't quote him, but I'm familiar yeah. with him. And, and that, you know, that, that was what you're looking at the Gnostics and the mystics uh, of, exactly. of Christianity. Very powerful stuff, yeah. but it just got totally thrown out the as heresy. The book of Thomas, the book of Mary Magdalene. Yeah. All of those. Yeah. And, and they, and I think that's why. They were hidden away in those jars that were, you know, when they were discovered, what, in the 40s, I guess, the 30s? Uh, yes, 40s. 40, 40s, I think. Yeah. Uh, Nagamati. And, Nagamati and uh, uh, the, uh, uh, at Quorum, the uh, Dead, sea Scrolls Dead Sea Scrolls at Quorum. Yeah, yeah. Powerful stuff. You know, when you read... Uh, and I'm, I'm getting you away from your the history of, of science, but when, <laughs> you got me in history. I love it. We're in history anyhow, right? <laughs> the, you know that the the book Thomas. You know that that book. Uh, I think hits closer to. You know when you when we read these things, we, I, I have to read not just with my eyes and my brain, but also my intuitive part of me, mm -hmm. because we do connect to uh, if we're aware of it. We connect to source in that area right there. Can you hold your thought and let me say I something? I can, go for it. One of the basic concepts of science of mind is that there is one source. With this one source, there is what he calls one mind. Right. And the one mind is the divine mind. And everybody can tune into the divine mind. Absolutely. Everybody can be part of it. And your intuition is what connects you with the divine mind. Uh, I have worked the last 10 years to follow my intuition. And I have found if I follow it, I'm never, ever wrong. Never, ever wrong. What I've found... Now I'll let you go back to what you were talking about. What, what I have found is if I walk out of my house and the sun is shining, it's a wonderful blue skies, everything is great, and I get that intuitive sense I should take my umbrella, if I don't, I'm drenched by the time I get home. Exactly. It's like you said, it's just never wrong. But it's I've spent never wrong. over 20 some years yes. following that, you know, and it's yeah. taken me to some places I never would and have chosen. How, how do we learn to follow our intuition? I can tell you how I did. I got plenty of bloody noses okay. going in the wrong direction, uh, you know, just so I had to start mm -hmm. paying attention to it. What I always say is the way to learn is just to start following it. Yep. Very consciously. Yeah, absolutely. Well, yeah. you know, the, the, there are a lot of people who really aren't at all connected to that part of themselves. Well, our society does not honor or recognize intuition. Um, we have women's intuition, but oh, that's just stupid old women's intuition. Uh, we have instinct, and instincts are very, very real, but they are very animal. You know, as a baby, uh, I had the instinct to cry, the instinct to suckle, uh, those things. But people don't even want to use the word intuition. Um, I have a book on stock trading, and the guy who's writing it gets along in it, and he says, you know, finally the you get to the feeling, point huh? where you have to use your gut feeling and just use your instinct, which, of course, is the wrong word. Yeah, he won't say your intuition. He won't go there. Gut won't feeling go. is what do you substitute? Gut feeling, heart feeling, that true knowing. Um, we can talk about intuition, but we need 16 words to do it, really. You want to tell us the 16? Well, we just said a yeah, okay. heart. In other words, a bunch of them. Yeah. Uh, well, you know, I think the, one of the problems is that we live in a, in a society that's run by males. Let's face it, you know, it's trying to change, but it's always been patriarchal. And, and men notoriously turn away from their feelings and don't want to talk about them. I've worked with so many men that can't even recognize what they feel. And right. It takes a long time to bring them down. And you and I as boys were taught not to go to our feelings. Absolutely, absolutely. You said you were a Marine. Yep. What if you had sat down emotionally and started to cry? Oh, good luck there. <laughs> you know, good luck with that one. And the Marines is bad. High school seniors, even worse. Oh, they're worse. <laughs> Far worse, yeah. 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 No, so, and, you know, there's some of that's changing. And I think 
new thought has a great deal to do with that. Yes. You know, that transformation. It's taken time. When you, but yet still, when you look at science of mind, 65, 75% of the people who go there are female. Right. And, and the males are notoriously missing from all of that. Right. You know, it's, uh, it's a female oriented. And th this program, our, our, our uh, and Facebook, uh, all, you know, our followers or friends, 65% of them are female. Mm -hmm. um, and it's unfortunate because what we need in the world today is more of what Ernest Holmes talked about in our politics. I would agree completely. In how the world's run. You and I joked before the beginning of the of the um, session about well, we were talking about this town and that we hadn't met before, and there's so many amazing metaphysical programs in this town. It is a vortex. Oh, absolutely, it vortex. absolutely is. And but what we were joking about was being token males. Yep. Uh, time and again. Absolutely. So you're absolutely right, and it's a thing that. The Council of Nicaea, again, had a great deal to do with that because the, any reference to any idea of the divine feminine was totally squashed and killed. There was no divine feminine left in the Christian church after the Council of Nicaea in whatever it was, 348 or whatever. A couple hundred years later, the Catholic Church found that they needed something like that and they resurrected the virgin mother right uh and they resurrected her but they hold her very tight and very contained so the divine feminine is not something that we've dealt with and yet i think it's a part of our ancient culture that's been very very covered do you, over do you think if we went back far enough into antiquity antiquity that we would find that there was a time when it was a matriarchal society, that the I, divine I feminine really was in, in play at that point. I don't know that it was a matriarchal society because of the type of um, necessities of the hunter, the, that type of thing. Uh, but I think it may have been a divine, the matriarchal, influence was in the divinity in the spirituality see i'm going in back, the way of thinking i'm going back further than what you're where you're where you're at with that i'm going back to atlantis lemuria that kind of thing where all we can do is guess all we can do is guess right all we can do is dance right. i know that the divine feminine was very powerful in egypt the divine feminine was extremely powerful Absolutely. and that's that's our closest link that we know Definitely back to those other, back to those other ones. civilizations, absolutely. But it wasn't the political matriarchal society, but the spiritual matriarchal society. Right, right. Well, of course, you know, in Cleopatra's time, it was political, even. Yeah. You know, so there was there was a lot of that going on. That you know that she could even be in that kind of a mm -hmm. of a thing. I, you know, uh, Jerry, when I first got into this stuff, and I'm sure it was with, with you. You know, if you talked about this around Christians, you were of the devil. And I, I mean, I've been it, accused of that very recently. <laughs> yeah, and you know, just given a really hard time around the mm -hmm. whole thing. It's it's changed considerably. It's far more mainstream than it was back in the early seventies. At this, oh, point. I don't know whether it's changed or I'm just talking to other people. <laughs> well, a little of both, maybe. <laughs> yeah, but I, I, excuse me, I have a dear, dear friend, who's father was a very fundamentalist minister passed away a few years ago i had met him delightful man and she has basically left that church and become much more not exactly science of mind but, but open. new thought open about once a year her mother gives her a book on how to get rid of new thought thought so that you'll be able to go to heaven and not spend eternity in hell absolutely and her mother gives her a different book every year with just a full heart knowing that she is doing the right thing for her daughter. Absolute sincerity and absolute belief. Yeah. You know, it's like, you know, what's interesting about that whole concept is, 
I can't think of one new thought person that's bombed a, an abortion center, shot anybody. You don't, we don't hear about it. Right. We really come from that place of love that some of these other religions claim to come from. But they, you know, I think, Jerry, a, a, a big part of the problem is when you read in the Bible, a lot of their rhetoric is very militant, very military. You know, like we're going to put on the shield of God, the armor of God, and God's going to come down and smote you and, you know, the jealous God and all that kind of thing. It, it has to lead to violence. We're, I, I think we're in a little trouble uh, as I look at our political system and what's going on with Christianity trying to take it over. Are you, have you watched that much? Um, you familiar with C Street? I, I have a master's degree in political science. Okay. <laughs> so I, I certainly hear you. And it's not anything new. No. It's, uh, it, it goes back for thousands of years. I mean, Constantine was doing it. It's happening in all of the religions. And I look at, I look at the religions, uh, the very fundamentalist, be they Christian, be they Muslim. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. I see a lot of very scared people. Hiding something. Well, Deeper in. Yeah, but I see scared Cover people. Something. I see people who are seeing their world as they know it being destroyed, disappearing. The world that they've known for hundreds, a thousand years, just falling apart. And they'll do anything to hold that world. And it's foolish because change occurs. Change is for real. I think that there's a lot of validity to that. But back in the, uh, like, 72 or 73, I, I decided that I was going to try fundamentalist Christianity. Mm -hmm. I joined a church in Orlando. I, I went the route. I thought, I'm going to learn how to speak in tongues. I'm gonna, and so I, if I'm going to be here, I'm going to find out what this is all about. Mm -hmm. Back then, they were, they were doing a couple of things. One, they were trying to think about bringing rock and roll into the music program, which it wasn't at that time. It was, it, But the other thing, they were actively talking about how they were going to take over the various uh, elected offices right up to the president. And, mm -hmm. you know, and, and I've watched it over these past 30-some mm -hmm. years. It, it is stronger today. I think you know it does go back to where you're talking about, but I think there's an ebb and flow. And I think we're on a high ebb right now. Uh, um, yeah, I don't totally agree with you. I, I think that it's, it's the type of thing that uh, different people get excited about it, mm -hmm. and uh, I think different people get publicized, and um, that's where the flow comes from. I, I think I think mostly it's just people who are afraid of change. They don't want to change their way of living, and they'll do most anything. And of course, politics is one of those things. You know, we had a thing here in Sarasota for years where there was to be no development the other side of I-75. Oh, I we had a moratorium, too, yeah. on, on building periods. And even before that, I mean, yeah. they would not run sewers, they wouldn't run water, they yeah. wouldn't... I-75 was like the Great Wall of China. And there were just those people who said, we don't want the change. Absolutely. And I think that's where it comes from, is this horrendous fear of change. Yeah, I, I think you're right with what you're saying. But I think there's there's another more powerful thing in there uh, about uh, belief. If they don't believe what we believe, you know, that's very divisive and very powerful. So. Yeah. Well, I think you and I could probably talk for a couple of days, a couple of weeks, a month or two. Probably. I, you're you're really knowledgeable and really enjoyable to talk with. Well, thank you. Yeah, I uh, we'll have to have you on again at some point and. Uh, and we'll get into some really controversial stuff. <laughs> and, uh, I, you know, the, the one thing I think is so essential to politics, to religion, to all of this, is, is a willingness to sit down and listen to one another. Absolutely. And we don't do that enough. Absolutely. We're too much, at, too much in the defense of what we believe. Absolutely. And, and one of the things that New Thought talks about and it also fits right in with what you were talking about of the difference of men and the women is new thought comes at things from the point of view of 
this human and me, we're both a part of God. We are equal parts of God. Right. If, if I love me, I love you. And if I love you, I can't fight you that way. Now, we may differ in our opinions, but if I come at it from that approach, how we argue, how we discuss is very different than going to war. It's very different than the shooting and, and all of that. And that's very basic to New Thought. Absolutely. Very basic. Well, you know, the, 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 the deal is, and here's where the, where the root problem is, is that the world really has a deficiency of self-love. Uh, people suffer all over the world from that ability to love self. Absolutely. You know, and, and until we really are able to find our way to that, it's going to be hard to find our way together. Right. You know, it just we're, it just separates us. We're yeah. back to what you talked about, fear. Right. Self-love, I'm sorry, lack of self-love almost equates with fear. I think they're. I think they're. You know, they're exactly yeah. diametrically. Yeah, they're just yeah. the opposite so, of yeah. one and the other. I think we've run out of time. Wow, well, uh, it went it's way too very, fast. Very enjoyable. Way it went too way fast. too fast. And I, I look forward to you know at some point seeing you out of this circumstance, having a cup of coffee or lunch with you. I'd enjoy uh, that. And I, I, I'm I, I, at this point. I wish I'd known you before. Uh, and I'm sure. Thank you. Uh, me too. Yeah, I'm sure we'll we'll get uh, we'll get time together. I especially want to talk with you about the things we disagree about, uh, only because they're fun. Yes. You know. <laughs> Can I plug a couple of things? Absolutely. Or we out of time? Please do. Well, one of the things I'd like to plug is, not this coming semester, but the following semester, I am going to teach a class in the adult program at USF, uh, the continued learning program on the history of New Thought. Uh, this semester at USF, they have a program on meditation, uh -huh. which is led by a dear friend of mine, and she brings in a speaker for each week, and it's just a wonderful program. Who, who is the, uh, uh, the woman? Dudino, and she, her, her program is, is very good. She's run it for a couple of years now, and each time she runs it, she brings different people. Great. And it's a very... The, the people who are in the class, taking the class, just love it. They're very excited. So it's meditation in the adult learning. Super. Uh, and I'm writing a book. What are you writing? It's a spiritual History? book. And it's called The Handbook of Spirituality, The One They Never Gave Us. When you, when you get that published, when you're completed with it, get, contact me. I'll have you back on the show. I'd love to. All right. We'll have you back. You got a website? Uh, not an active one. Okay, uh, how about an email? Um, G, and then my last, that's for Jerry. Yeah. Greg, which is my last name, at Comcast.net. And that's G-R-I? No. G-R-E-G? E-I-G. E-I-G. Yes. Jerry G Greg. G Greg. Yes. At Comcast. Yeah. Dot and it's net. not I before you, it's E before I. I e spell before it wrong, I. and it's not my fault. Well, we came in here wrong. Yeah, my folks told me I had to do it that way. I got you. <laughs> I'll look forward to seeing if, you. If you send it to the wrong spelling, it goes to some guy out in Utah who gets so much of my email, he really doesn't like it. <laughs> my daughter's got one of those kind of deals going on. Uh, so it's been a, a great show. I've had a good time with uh, Jerry. Uh, and on 99% of the stuff, we agree. We come from much the same background. I hope you had as good a time as I did. Come back next week. And in the meantime, don't forget to accentuate the positive and have a fantastic week.